Okay, um, welcome to the first stream and the first episode of the stream. The basic idea behind it is that we are going to be going through the process of building a game. Um, the game is going to be, at the moment, the idea is it's going to be your typical roguelike kind of game, but we're going to play around with the mechanics a little bit, play around with the setting, um, and play around with a lot of the, uh, the different things that we, we want to do. The whole idea behind this stream and this whole series of streams is that it's going to be really something that um, explores the whole process of game design. I'm personally much more of a game developer, uh, much more interested in the coding aspect. So we're going to be a lot doing a lot of prototyping, a lot of looking at code, a lot of exploring different things through code. But I'm going to try and show you the entire process that you would go through when it comes to actually um, developing and designing a game. So we're going to start out with something that's a little bit less technical, um, and that's the process that I'm going to be using for the actual design. Um, I'm trying to show you all the stuff that needs to be done when you're building a game. Um, and I've started with that just to give it uh, as a bit of an idea of where you want to go, some little bit of a guideline, and then we want to talk around that. Um, the things that I'm going to be mentioning today are not going to be everything that is needed. Obviously, it is quite important to um, keep your process flexible. Uh, sometimes the th new things will have to be added. Um, you might try something, it doesn't work out, and then you might redo some of the things that you need to do. Um, a lot of the stuff is going to be focused on the design and the art aspects of games as well, which is not my strong point. So uh, you guys are going to see a very interesting uh, journey of mine into improving my art skills, both in terms of 3D character design, 2D art. I'm quite excited about that. I can't really draw to save my life, but um, as every all my uh, colleagues and friends who are artists um, keep saying, is it's just about practice. So we'll see how that goes. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to be doing is going to be based on coding, um, as I said. So it's going to be a bit of a um, mix and match between the two of those. The live stream is probably going to focus a little bit more on me actually coding things, as that makes a little bit more sense in terms of um, I can really show you that. Uh, my coding is my strong point, which means that um, you don't have to spend as much time watching me struggle to draw a basic circle or a basic shape. Um, some of the art stuff will probably be more uh, where I actually do stuff offline and then come back and show you, okay, cool, this is what I've done, this is how I did it, this is what I learned out of this process. Okay, so that's what we want to do. Uh, that's where we want to go. Um, but before we get to the actual process of designing the game, I want to talk about the process of managing this process. Uh, it might seem a little bit tautological there, but it's very important to make sure that you know what you are doing and where you want to go. So um, as you guys can see on my screen, I've got Trello open over here. Uh, Trello is one of many different tools that you can use for design, for collaboration, for m project management, all those different kinds of things. I'm going to use it as a very basic project management tool. Um, it's based around a couple of different methodologies, a couple of uh, history um, where it comes from. But the basic idea is that um, what you would have is you would be working in a team of people. You would divide up what you need to do, um, write those onto little post-its and little cards, post those on a whiteboard. Um, and you have different categories. And then if somebody wants to work on a certain um, aspect, they would take that little uh, note or that post-it. They take it from the to-do column into the busy column. And then they would work on that. And that way you would make sure everybody's working what they should be working on. Nobody's working on the same thing. Or you don't have two people working on the same thing at the same time. If you could know weird issues like that. Um, and it just, the process is also very easy to see the progress that you're doing. So that's the same kind of idea I'm going to be using as well. It's also sometimes known as the Kanban process. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I'm going to use it much more just for myself so that I can keep track of what I'm doing um, on my own, exactly what I need to do. So this would make a little bit more sense if I had more collaborators with me, but that's fine. The basic principle and the basic design also works. So if you guys can see what is going on over here, we'll just uh, zoom in a little bit. Um, 
I've taken Trello, I've created four columns for me to work with here, and each one of these columns is gonna have a little card, and each card, as I dig into it, will have more and more information and more and more actual content that will become a part of it. The basic idea is, is that I've got three main cards, uh, or three main columns that I'm interested in. My to-do column, stuff I still need to do, my busy column, what am I currently working on, and my done column, where I can tick stuff off and say, yes, I've done this, well done, that's also nice. I also have an ideas column over here, which I just like, um, if I just have an idea, something comes to mind, I can pop it inside of there. Um, one of the things that I've just also done, which works really nice with Trello, is I've color coded my little cards. So you'll see I can edit my labels and I've defined a couple of labels so far. Game design, user interaction, user interface art, and code. Um, there will probably be a couple more that need to um, actually pop up there and then some that might need to change um, as well as we go through the, the process. But um, this just helps me to at a glance see exactly what I am doing and what I actually want to display, um, what I want to actually, so that I know what I'm working on, which is very important just to keep track of what's going on. So what I've done here is I've started, I've created a couple of um, card so far that I want to start with and more, more importantly I've created uh, three different categories over here that we probably need to add a fourth one or change one of them to a uh, different one. So I've got a game design category and that's very much about the process of actually designing a game. What are my mechanics? How's my balance? Um, what kind of things, challenges um, uh, will you have in the game? What kind of actions can the player overcome? very standard game design kind of elements. And as we get into them, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about the theory as well. Um, this is something that uh, I enjoy doing and as um, uh, will become, hopefully you'll become more aware of, this is actually something I teach as well. A little bit of game design, quite a lot of game development itself. So game design is something I'm interested in um, and there's a lot of interesting things that we can talk about uh, around that. Also, there's a section for user interaction that's very important as well, making sure that the UI, the user interaction, that whole process is um, a little bit, is well done, is well designed, and makes sense for the user as well. We're going to have art, which is here in this lovely orange, um, where I'm going to be talking about the design, the art style, um, things like that. That's going to be very much based on me doing research and finding styles that I like and see how much I can apply that to my own game. A lot less um, of me drawing and actually showing you guys all kinds of artistic techniques, but maybe something interesting will come out of that. And then we've got the blue um, category, which is just for coding. Uh, this one is gonna be expanded quite a lot, but obviously that's not the first thing that you usually want to do is actually just start with the coding. One thing I just wanna change over here is I've got a section on narrative. Um, and narrative is, more than what just one little, one little block. Narrative, in fact, should be a label itself, which we're just going to rename over here. And then what that means is that this actual uh, card itself should probably be something else in the terms of uh, backstory. Now, the kind of game that I'm trying to develop is a roguelike, um, and what that means is it's quite a lot of procedural generation, there's quite a lot of um, multiple play th playthroughs, so we might not have a very strong dialogue or actual narrative that we need to work with, so the narrative section might not be quite big, but we might expand that a little bit more um, later on as well. Um, what I, uh, sorry, just checking something there on the stream bitrate, hopefully that'll pick up. What we really want to kind of um, focus on is, and the approach that I want to use is very much a prototype based approach. So the idea is I want to build a lot of small little prototypes where we'll test out a lot of the different things um, that my game actually does. So. I want to start 
thinking about the game design, things like the um, how the, the units will actually work, the combat mechanics will work, some level design elements, all those kind of things. But I also want to start coding and building things as soon as possible. And that's just because that's fun and it helps me think about the process of what I'm doing. So what I actually want to start with today is um, a bit of a leap in terms of where we want to go. Because if we just quickly switch over to Visual Studio Code, um, if we are talking about the kind of things that we want to do, sorry, that is obviously the first rule of the internet. Whenever you try and do something on the internet, there will be a cat that interferes with what you're trying to do. Um, I just want to give a brief outline of the kinds of things that I would like to do and the process that I want to follow. So the basic process is something basically in this kind of idea that you want to have your high concept as well as your game design done. Then you want to do a prototype. And then what you want to do is you want to then take this prototype, which tests a lot of the ideas that you have. You want to then convert this into a final product, which is basically your game design plus your pro -co type. I will get prototype spelled right eventually. This is a very basic, uh, very simplified approach that um, is very often taken. But what we want to do is we want to try and see if we can improve this a little bit uh, or just change it up a bit. I want to do a much more prototype based approach. So what it would look like is I would do some kind of game design on one aspect. Maybe, for example, the um, combat mechanics. And then I want to create a prototype for the combat mechanics. And then I will create, do some game design on the procedural, or what really would, would be level design. And then I would do a prototype for some pro procedural level design. And so on and so forth until eventually we get to step 99, whatever it might be, which will be my game design. Uh, my final product will then be game design plus prototype one, prototype two, prototype three, and so on and so forth. So the idea being that you slowly build up all these different prototypes um, and you build up the game out of these little, small little different prototypes. Now, a lot of design doesn't actually follow this kind of approach because you want to do everything together as one big process that you do. But ideally what I would like to do is actually make sure that I can build small little um, sections, small little prototypes, put them all together and then hopefully come up with something that's quite nice. The other reason for this small prototype design and building all these little individual prototypes is that each one fits nicely into a one or maybe two hour live stream episode. So you don't have to watch all of these things come together at once, but you can see it building up slowly, step by step. So that's the basic idea, the basic approach that we want to take. And if we just switch back to Trello, this is what I have in general in terms of what I want to do, the tasks that I have. So a lot of these things, I'm just going to add a code label to them as well because they will involve a small prototype that needs to be added um, as well to a lot of these different things as well. I'm definitely going to have to do some coding when it comes to the UX. We have to play around with that quite a bit. 
uh, level design elements, that is going to be something that's not going to be done as its own prototype. Instead, as part of my procedural generation algorithm, I'll definitely do a prototype as part of that. Um, and that should be quite fun to do as well. And my character system, we can probably just create a very basic uh, prototype of that as well. And then there will be some kind of base prototype that I'll be building everything on um, together. So that's the process that I want to take and kind of the approach that I want to take. But we will see if we can get um, a little bit more value out of uh, what's happening here and actually build this up a little bit more uh, as we go through the process. So this board this document is a living document it's flexible it will change as we go through the process so things might move around ideas might come in and all kinds of different things might start actually um, happening so i just want to talk a little bit about one other thing that i haven't added but i wanted to keep that um, for the end and that is my high concept now when we are doing game design we need to have some kind of idea of what it is we're actually um, trying, what is this game about? And this is something that you can very easily kind of think of as your elevator pitch, your single definition of what the game is. You want to make it, keep it short, you want to keep it basic, but you want to be able to describe your game in a couple of sentences. Um, Traditionally, the idea behind the high concept document is as is if you're in a studio and you need to pitch this to a producer or a production company or publisher, um, this is what would sell it to them. Uh, this game I'm just doing for fun, so it's not as serious as that, but I would like to, for myself, have a very clear idea of what I want to build and what the idea behind the game is. Um, this is very important because this will allow me to actually define a whole kinds of different thing uh, all the different things that I need to do so what I really want to think about is what does this actually what is this game actually all about now you'll see I've used the word arcology over here in terms of the name of my uh, game and it's also the name of the live stream as well um, and that's the core concept that I really want to build my game around now if you not don't know what arcology is we ask our good friend um, Google, and an arcology is an ideal integrated city contained within a massical virtual structure allowing maximum conservation of the surrounding environment. So the idea behind it is, the ideal is you've got this massive tower, this massive building, if you look at some of these images, which will definitely probably become part of um, some of our level design and concept design. But you've got one big city and uh, you've got a city which is built into a building and, and everything that you need is built into that massive city. Now, this is the ideal. This is the um, optimal idea of what an arcology should be, which is great. Um, if you ever played the original or some of the oldest SimCity games, then um, you would have uh, run into that idea. So that's the final version of the actual um, building that you can build but we are building a game this is not an ideal future this is not an ideal world that we are, are living in we want to think about the idea of um, our player is going to have some challenges that they're going to have to overcome so we want to look maybe a little bit into the cyberpunk genre which is very nice for um, uh, Google to give us some of those images um, we get some images that look quite rem reminiscent of Blade Runner, um, some ideas that are reminiscent of uh, Ghost in the Shell. Um, we might even find some Warhammer 40k ideas. S a lot of these slightly more dystopian ideas are coming through, and that is essentially the kind of idea that we want. Um, a roguelike game is all about combat. Um, we can't really have combat in an ideal future city that we want to work with. We want stuff that's maybe a little bit more um, dark, a little bit more Blade Runner-ish. And then we, there we start getting the idea behind our arcology, what it might look like. Um, 
There was another word there that I really wanted to look for, which was dystopian. We want to go for a dystopian kind of um, arcology. Um, the idea being, and it's a very typical sci-fi trope, but that um, the higher levels of your society live above the clouds, lower levels live in the muck and the darkness, um, uh, the smog, and those kind of ideas, which works really well with our concept of a roguelike. So let's have a little bit uh, look at what a roguelike is, so we can just define that as well. This is all be going to become part of our actual um, high concept document. So let's just jot down some ideas here. We want our ecology, massive city building, this dystopia. Cyberpunk, these are the kind of things that we would probably want to have a look at. These are going to be the influences um, on our game. What we also want to make sure that we have is that Sorry, just realized the stream is slowing down a bit. Not sure why that's happening. Um, everything should be fine, but uh, we should catch up quite soon. Um, we want to use these as kind of our core concepts and core words that we want to build around. So it's going to be an ecology, but it's uh, an ecology roguelike. So we've got ecology, which is our main idea, and then what we also want is what is it? What does a roguelike mean? What do we mean by roguelike? Um, and roguelike is something that you might see a lot of uh, examples. Very often, it's, it's become a genre on its own, but it is based on the original game Rogue. So, which looks something like this: you've got procedural uh, regenerated rooms, you've got a little character. Uh, which is all an ASCII character based and you move around between these procedurally generated rooms. Um, now there's a couple of different versions of them. Um, you can see this is quite an old school uh, style um, game but there's been quite a couple of um, variants of that. Um, you might know about NetHack if you've um, explored the idea of behind a roguelike um, and my personal favorite is Angband based on the works of Tolkien, really based around the idea of Lord of the Rings. And then the idea is that you have to um, survive a hundred levels of the floor of the fortress in order to, to defeat Morgoth. Morgoth being uh, one of the big bads, if not the big bad in the Tolkien mythology. Um, because it's based on Tolkien, there's a lot of cool Tolkien related um, creatures from the movies um, well, not really from the movies. I, this was made before the movies existed, but from the books, both The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and um, his entire uh, legendarium um, collected works, all of those different kind of things. The idea behind here that really kind of uh, interests me is this idea of 100 levels of fortress. So I'm just going to copy that out because that is a very nice link to the idea of, a, of an arcology. Um, we've got this massive fortress that we want to fight through, that we want to um, level through. Um, roguelike is also procedurally generated, usually. And it's very much based on and influenced by things like Dungeons and Dragons, which means it needs very strong um, character design and character I'm going to call it character character creator character sheet and your character's progression is one of the key things that you're interested in you want to see how can I level up how can I make my character as strong as possible um, other things that is very common in roguelike is permadeath which is definitely something that um, I'm interested in exploring within this game as well and it is very much based around the idea of 
exploration, but it's exploration of the game as a whole. You're not really exploring the levels within the game, but you're exploring how the game works. You probably need to play through a couple of times before you get to a point where it, it's actually worthwhile for you. You really understand the game and you get to grips with it. So that is things that I'm interested in. So we want to make some kind of roguelike. It's set in a massive building, uh, some kind of dystopian future, some kind of dystopia, um, probably some kind of cyber uh, punk influence as well. Cyberpunk influence is nice because that allows us to do things like um, psionics, nanotechnology, hacking as an additional part of your character skills which would go beyond, um, which would be equivalent to what you might have in your normal Dungeons and Dragons kind of game where you might have magic um, and the ability to cast spells and those kind of things. We want to have some kind of non-combat related skills that the player can also actually do and work with. So that's very interesting uh, and very important for us as well. So this is our description, some of the keywords that, wa that we want. But what is our game actually going to be about? Um, and we want to we need to explore the roguelike genre a little bit more before we can get to that because there's one or two decisions that we need to make. And the important thing always to keep in mind with the high concept is we're making big decisions over here. Um, these two words, by defining these two words as this is what my game is about, I have eliminated 99% of other possible games. We're not making a battle or a hell. We're not making a match three game. We're not making a um, cooperative shooter. Uh, there are a hundred, if not more, different genres that are being um, ignored or that we are not interested in. We are making big decisions which really define what our game is going to be. So that means two things first. Number one, we are going to keep this as um, flexible as possible for now, but we also need to be very careful about the actual decisions we are making at this point. The decisions we make here will affect the entire rest of our game. So if you're not happy about a decision at this point, you need to take some time to think about it, make sure this is what you want. For myself, these are exactly the things that I do want within my game. Um, there is one final decision that I need to make in terms of the roguelike genre that is just very important. So, and that is gonna have a massive impact on the rest of the stuff that we will be doing. So if we go to roguelike, um, If you look through the kind of gameplay description, um, what is not really obvious here, but the character is um, generally single player, and it's only a single character that's being controlled. If we look at things like um, NetHack, you will see this little at symbol over there. If we just zoom in on that, that little at symbol is the one character that you play. There's a a dragon or a drake or some other creature that you need to fight against some doors but the idea here really is that it's only one character um, the same with a lot of the other um, roguelikes that they discuss here that fall under this uh, brand is the idea that um, roguelikes are um, single player and it's also very much based on one character that you're playing with See, if we look through a lot of these other options, there are very few ones that are multiplayer. Um, there's a lot of current games that have come out which are um, very borrow very heavily from the idea of roguelikes, things like Dead Cells, um, which is quite a fun game to play if you haven't played it yet. But once again, you're one single character, one single player that you're playing. Um, and that's the idea that you're going along there. So what I would like to do is to not flip that concept on its head, but play around with that idea. Because of our arcology dystopia kind of um, scenario, um, if you think about a massive building with tons, uh, thousands, if not millions of people in one building, um, 
this would probably be not the kind of uh, building which one person would work in or attack, for lack of a better word, which leads us back to what is our character actually doing in this building? So what I don't want to take as too much of a, a, an, an obvious kind of influence, but um, there's this chap which you might have heard about, if I can just spell him correctly, um, is Judge Dredd. Um, dystopian, set in um, the future, very much the idea is that um, the world that he lives in has got a lot of um, these ecologies, these massive buildings in, and the idea behind it is, is that he is a um, single character within this game that can actually, um, that uh, if we were to turn this into a game, which I'm pretty sure it has been done before, um, you would play as the this single character, this one judge that has to police an entire building. Um, to make it a little bit more interesting and maybe a little bit more realistic, I want to talk about the concept maybe of a squad-based game. The idea being that you do not only play as one character, you play as um, a squad of characters. There's a couple of reasons why um, this is interesting, but there's also a couple of disadvantages to this as well. The one thing that it does kind of negate is the idea of permadeath. If you've got a squad of characters that you're controlling instead of one single character, um, permadeath becomes less um, severe. Uh, there's also options where you've your squad can be reinforced, um, different things like that. You could play around with that idea as well. So permadeath is not as serious. Um, a lot of uh, players are not big fans of permadeath. Um, it's not necessarily um, something that everybody likes. So if you've got a squad-based game, you've got a four or six, if one of the characters dies, even though they might die permanently, that is something which is quite unfortunate, but it doesn't end the game right there. Squad-based game is also quite tactical, which makes the actual combat system, the mechanic system, um, something that can be strongly focused on and make it quite an important part of the game. If we can work with our formatting over here. Um, just by the way, the formatting that is used over here should be marked on formatting, so um, that is just something that's quite nice about Trello as well. Um, but what we want is we want some kind of tactics. Um, this immediately, if you know uh, anything about gaming, should make you think about things like the XCOM series. Um, an excellent video game series in my opinion, one of my favorites to play as well. Um, you play as a group or a squad, as a person, as the commander who's in charge of a um, a squad of alien hunters, alien fighters, in a number of different scenarios. As you can see, there is a whole bunch of different um, games and different versions um, based on that. Um, things like uh, Fallout Tactics, also ba based around that, and the more um, recent um, Mutant Year Zero, Road to Eden, um, has got that very much kind of squad-based um, idea. So this is something that is going to make a massive difference in how the game plays. Within a standard roguelike, you create control one character and the actions that you do would be very granular. You would make one move action and then every other character which would be all the enemy characters, they would be able to make their move actions as well, uh, or their attack actions, or however it might be. And the speed of your character becomes very important as a kind of mechanic as well. The moment a game becomes squad-based, the way we implement it needs to change. Um, we need to think about, does our entire team um, 
have one move and they can all move and then the enemy moves? Do we have some kind of initiative system which is very similar to what you might have in Dungeons and Dragons? So depending on the actual skill of your character, they would move, they would not move. Um, the roguelike is usually the roguelikes usually design the idea of an entire level so there are things happening in the level that you can't see um, your characters are running away how does that work as well in terms of the squad based idea this is not an easy decision this might be something that will come, bi come back to bite me but I think I am going to go for the squad based game idea um, it's interesting it also adds uh, a new twist to the standard uh, roguelike idea which makes it just a little bit more interesting and a little bit um, different from a lot of like, the other clones that we've done as well. The squad-based game also allows us to possibly add some interesting AI implementations as well, um, and even possible multiplayer, um, which is probably not something that we're going to get to at any point soon within this series but it does allow um, some possibilities that we need to do over there it does mean that our base prototype for how our actual combat works how our movement works and how our um, mechanics work within the game character design those kind of things they're also um, quite critical to figure out um, they will be very important to make sure that we understand what we're doing over there. But I think that is going to be what we're going to do. So just to neaten this up a bit, we're going to make it a squad-based game. It's going to be a roguelike. And it's going to be based on this idea of a massive arcology. Okay, so this is our high concept almost done. Um, there's one thing that we just need to finalize, and this is the idea of the hundred levels of the fortress. So when we talk about game design, one of the big things we talk about is um, difficulty. Um, the challenges that we are presenting to our player and how do these challenges and this difficulty scale how does that scale in the context of the actual skills and ability of the player both within the game in terms of the character as well as the player's skills uh, outside of the game as they learn how the game works so we want both a mechanics based approach to why there are these hundred levels of the fortress but we also want a narrative approach as well how do these things all fit together luckily we can steal a little bit of the standard trope from um, some animes and some um, general uh, dystopian kind of stories i think altered carbon has very much got this idea. One of the big things about Altered Carbon is that your um, your uh, buildings, um, and there's quite a nice example over here, is um, your buildings actually reach up above the clouds. So your most, uh, the richest se segments of society would live above the clouds, the poorest would live way below it. Uh, we can find some examples. Um, dingy, uh, smog covered, neon lights, that kind of idea is the kind of image that we're going, which is happening at the lower levels of our city. So that gives us a nice kind of level system for lack of a better word where higher higher levels uh, equals to your uh, upper class ruling class and 
your low levels are your workers, criminals, etc. So this gives us an interesting kind of for lack of a better word Get some formatting going here. Um, this idea behind the level system that we've got some kind of high level and low levels and that there's a gradation between them and as you go higher things become richer and more advanced and more modern as you go lower things become um, more well become worse become uh, life becomes harder becomes more criminal it gives us an interesting way that we can actually approach the structure of our game and the narrative of our game because it's very important to think about what's the actual story behind our game in a roguelike, you are generally playing a, for lack of a better word, unknown adventurer, unknown hero, but um, we can make something interesting out of this. So the general idea behind roguelikes like Angband is that you're starting from the top of this massive underground fortress and you're trying to work your way down to low depths to eventually defeat um, the big bad of the game. But... What I think we'll do is we will flip that around and that you will start at the low levels and try and end up at the high levels. It gives us a nice narrative hook. Um, you are some kind of as a worker, slave, criminal kind of character and you are trying to escape out of your current situation by reaching the top of the arcology you are in. Okay. Um, and that sentence over there almost I won't put it in quotes for that reason gives us our kind of high concept single sentence that explains our game um, we could probably talk a little bit more about why you're trying to do this um, and that will do some more narrative design around there um, you could go the very typical trope that your uh, loved a loved one a partner girlfriend boyfriend whatever it might be has been kidnapped by someone in the higher apps and you need to fight your way up to the top level to rescue them. Um, that's very tropish, uh, very kind of cliched, but it gives us an, a nice narrative. Um, but we might just for now stick to you just trying to make your way out of this horrible situation that you find your found yourself in. Um, and this also makes sense why you will then start with very basic weapons uh, or no weapons at all, very basic skills very making uh, um, these basic kind of things. Um, somebody's actually replied to this. Uh, this would be a 3D game and um, it would be a big project. So just so um, some people who are watching this know, there's a bit of a, um, a, a hidden agenda behind why I'm building this game. Um, it is also meant for um, some of the students I teach so that I can sneak in um, some education with them as well. So it's going to be bit by bit, piece by piece, uh, slowly built up um, as we go along. Um, 
Um, Samuel, who's just uh, joined in the chat, actually brings up a very good point about this is a huge project. This is very true, but the one thing that um, I'm going to do to cheat, in a sense, uh, to make the project not as huge is to focus a lot more on things like um, game design, um, the coding, and a lot less on the art style. Partially because this is not my strong point, but also because um, this allows me to do a lot of stuff procedurally and to generate a lot of stuff um, in that sense. Um, I can get quite a lot done and do quite a lot of that um, if I still stick to a very basic art style. So I want to do a nice 3D art style if I can, um, but keep it very, very basic um, because that is not my strong point. Um, I do have friends and colleagues who are artists and 3D modelers and designers, and I'm hoping at some point they will pop in and provide some input, um, uh, tell me all the things I'm doing wrong. But uh, that is the general idea. If you can keep it as basic as possible in terms of the art style, um, but focus on a strong coding base, um, that for me is a way to make a game that's quite interesting, but I can still eventually end up with um, something that is quite playable, and then get people to help me, or spend just some more time in actually developing the actual um, art it itself, building it up slowly but surely. Uh, this raises another interesting point, um, something that we're going to have to think of at some point, and this is always uh, a critical part, but something I like to call the architecture. And by architecture, yeah, I don't mean the architecture of the building that I'm going to be creating, but the actual code architecture of how I'm going to put uh, everything together. Um, how, what different kind of layers, what different kind of APIs I'm going to be connecting to, what different classes I'm going to have, what different objects I'm going to have, what different units um, of code, um, all those different kind of things. This is going to be a massive decision, and I don't want to make that entire decision right now, um, because depending on the choices that I make in terms of my narrative, um, which I've already started thinking about um, things like the fact that I want it to be a squad based game means that my architecture will be quite different than if it was just one single character that you're using. So I want to play around a little bit with some prototyping before I actually get to the architecture. So that is the basic idea of what I want to do. That's the basic um, game that I want to create. Quite a lot of stuff that needs to be done, but what I like to do often when I am designing any program is I like to start from the inside out. I like to start with what I think is probably going to be the most complex part. Um, get a prototype of that just off the ground. Even if it's very, very basic, that allows me just at least to know that Yes, this thing that I want to do could possibly work. Um, and maybe this fancy idea that I want to add is not going to work, but I can just ignore that or I need to do some more research on how to do this. So I want to start with the core of the game, whatever that might be. And for a roguelike, it's a procedurally generated level system where there's some kind of combat between some kind of characters. So the big thing I want to look at is procedural generation. So I don't want to make uh, each of these individual live stream sessions too long, but I just want to start looking at some ideas for how we're going to do that. So my high concept, I'm going to keep in the busy column because I'm still busy with it, but I want to take my game design um, my procedural generation algorithm, and I'll pop that in there as well because I want to start thinking about that as well. So let's expand that and open that up um, a little bit more. So we are going to have procedurally designed levels. This is really um, the core of what the game is going to do. These levels are going to need to um, increase in difficulty 
at a correct pace. Um, I'm being vague here because defining what increasing at a uh, correct pace is, is quite difficult to actually um, uh, really uh, define precisely, but we will get to that. We will talk quite a little bit about that as well, but uh, that's quite important. Um, it needs to create levels that are tactically interesting. If we are going to be creating a, squ a squad-based tactical game, um, it makes sense to think about things like um, uh, we can allow for flanking, destructible terrain, etc. We, we, we want our levels not just to be um, boring corridors that you run through and that you shoot things and kill things at. And we want our levels to feel somewhat unique. We want each level somewhat unique, at least. Um, one of the big problems with um, roguelikes and procedure generated games in general is that you get a lot of sameness because that's just the way that procedural generation works. But we want to see if we can at least get the feeling that each level is a little bit different, a little bit unique. Um, so we're going to need to talk about how we're going to be able to do that as well. So these are the basic ideas that we want when it comes to our procedurally designed levels. Um, We also want to generate the this generate the whole dystopian aesthetic. Um, it must feel like you're in a dystopia. You're in this massive ecology. Um, I don't want to use the word grimdark because that is very Warhammer 40k. But at least initially, that is some of what the feeling um, that you should get. Um, we're probably going to need to do quite a lot of work in terms of narrative and backstory to create our own unique environment, our own unique world. So, um, but that that'll that'll come around. The the this this whole process is iterative, where we'll go back to certain cards, certain processes, um, redo them. Uh, after we've done them, um, done them, fix other things, go back, go forth. Um, that whole idea. So. There's a couple of ways in which we can approach this, but what we want is to look at some techniques that we can use. So this is where we are going to do some prototyping. Um, and we're going to keep it interesting. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to try and, and throw as many different technologies as we can and as, uh, as many different things as we can at it. But one of the things I really like um, when it comes to procedural generation is cellular cellular automata, automata, auto automata. Um, um, very nice. And that does sound like some kind of um, new uh, anime game, but uh, to be true, it's a very basic system of mathematically approximating or simulating um, how natural processes work. And this has got the ability to create quite organic looking um, structures, levels, things like that. Um, we will dive quite a bit more into that when I get to actually developing it. But that is quite nice as a technique for creating things that look um, organic. Now, you might think organic doesn't really fit in with um, our whole idea of a futuristic dystopian ecology. And that is true, but we can think of organic here as being um, a 
accrued over time. So think of a ramshackle um, building that has got additions that have been made over time and fixes and um, maintenance and it's rusty because as people have been living and moving and as life has happened, it has been changing organically. It was maybe designed and planned in a specific way, but it has kind of grown beyond that. Um, and that can give us a nice organic feeling um, as well. Um, another very interesting technique is called Perlin noise, um, which is just a way of generating random noise that is not just completely random, but actually has a very nice, um, or we can have the ability to actually have quite a nice smoothness to it, for lack of a better word. Um, a very, uh, one of the most common examples of um, a game that uses polar noise and probably a lot of other techniques as well, but it's something like Minecraft, where you've got these random um, terrains that are generated, but they've got a smoothness um, to them. So we can use that kind of idea um, as well. And really, polar noise can be used to actually create defined areas for us. So we can say, well, we have certain areas that are of this type, certain areas that are of that type, um, and it feels like there's a smooth transition be between the areas. If we combine these two, we've get, we get some kind of structured layout, but that has got changed um, organically over time. And then the last thing that I want to do is a, I want to call it a template approach. And this is um, a very typical thing you see in a lot of games, but this is where you've got um, a couple of predefined rooms and you slap them together, rotate them randomly, and then you get um, levels which are technically different each time but look very um, similar. So I want to use that, but this will be to create the, what I'm gonna call original structure. So the idea behind this is that we use our template approach. This creates the skeleton of the building. If you think in terms of how this building would have been designed, all 200, 300, 400, 500 floors would all have been designed at one point um, with high hopes everybody was thinking this building is gonna change the way we live. Um, we've got structure. We've got space for um, everything that we need within this building. Um, uh, energy, uh, airflow, electricity, light, everything is gonna work really great. There's gonna be no issues um, because we're gonna be following this very kind of structured architectural approach. So we can use the template approach to initially design levels that are going to look quite structured and quite um, properly designed but then we can add some Perlin noise to this to say, well, not every level is gonna look exactly the same. Um, if you think about a massive building like this, certain levels would be dedicated to industry, certain levels would be dedicated to commerce, certain levels might be dedicated to entertainment, other levels might be dedicated to um, living quarters. Perlin noise allows us to kind of create a uh, slightly more realistic definition between these different areas. And then finally, we add the cellular automata. We kind of rough it up a bit to say, okay, well, people have been living in this building for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It's not being used for its original purposes. Um, walkways have been broken down um, the lifts or the elevators, if you are American, are broken. Um, people are using living in the stairs. All kinds of things have changed. So that roughens it up. And this at the end gives our final level design. Which I'm just going to build because that is quite important. That's where we're going to end up at the end of the day. So this is what we're aiming for. Our levels are going to be tactically interesting because we can use this template-based approach where we can de define 
areas that we know will always be technically interesting, will always be um, complex to play through. Um, areas we know where uh, characters can be flanked, those kind of things. We want to be able to increase the difficulty at the correct place. We can use the Perlin noise for that, where we can actually define slopes, both mathematically and, um, in a sense, in-game. Um, I, I will explain what I actually mean by how we're going to use Perlin noise, because if, you, if you're trying to picture a Minecraft terrain and you're trying to picture these typical roguelike levels, you might not see how they map. But um, we should be able to get something interesting out of that, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in a future uh, episode. Um, but that'll allow us to create levels that increase difficulty at a correct pace. Um, they will also feel somewhat unique because of the Perlin noise. And um, our cellular automator should be able to generate this dystopian aesthetic for us because things are breaking down, things are changing, things have organically changed. There used to be four rooms here, but whoever was living here broke out these rooms to make it a big communal living space. Or there used to be a big open um, shopping area or commercial area, and now whoever's living there has actually built a whole bunch of shacks or smaller spaces inside it, or whatever it might be. But we get this kind of hopefully dystopian aesthetic and because cellular automator um, has got quite a random um, feel to it even though um, that depends really on the seed that you're starting with every level should feel unique to some extent okay um, that's one hour of um, live coding it's uh, quite late in the Sunday afternoon here where I am so I'm gonna call it an evening for now but hopefully that gives you an idea of um, a little bit of game design process, uh, a little bit of an idea of how one could, one way, just one way, of planning out what you want to do. Um, some of the things that you would need to do, um, high concept, very important, get an idea of what you want to do at a high level. We are going to dig into these things in um, a lot more detail. Um, uh, things like uh, the tacticalness of the squad-based games, how it, uh, the, the roguelike uh, levels will be procedurally generated, the idea of exploration, the character creation, all of those will be dug into um, in a lot more detail, but we've got a basic idea of what we want to do, which is actually quite um, encouraging and quite satisfying. And we've started with something which is probably the most important thing to get right. Um, and this also d depends on your own level of experience, how much have you, uh, how much game development have you done before. If you've done some combat, you've been able to do some mechanic design, you've been able to do some character design, um, maybe don't start with that, even though that's your strong point, rather start with something that's a little bit more complex. So I have done some procedural generation before and it's something that I find absolutely fascinating, but I want to see if I can get a kind of level design idea out of this um, that really is going to give me the feeling that I want. This is going to be probably done, uh, the coding for this is going to be done as a very basic prototype. The prototype is probably just going to print out um, a little 2D array of characters or numbers with very specific values in them which would just going to be used for testing. So there won't be any 3D development yet at this point but um, we're going to start thinking about those kind of things. So when we start talking about the template approach as well, there we can start talking about, well, we can use 3D models, um, how adjustable or parameterizable are these 3D models, can we change them as we go along, things like that. If we can get this done, and this is not going to be easy, but if we can get this done, doing things like a combat system, a character system, is a little bit easier to build around that. So I always like to start out with the more difficult thing, if I can. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that is interesting. Um, I know this is supposed to be some live game development, no actual coding, and that's just because the truth of the matter is that a lot of game development doesn't necessarily have to include code. We are going to get into that soon, and hopefully you will be there and um, be able to have a look um, uh, at this game. Um, please feel free to um, contact me on the channel chat or um, send any messages if you've got any questions about this um, or uh, anything like that. Um, I will talk a little bit 
next week about um, some issues around this word which we all currently hate in the context of gaming. I'm not going to give it a label because it doesn't really fit in, but that is something very important that I want to talk about more in terms of um, the intellectual property around um, this game. Let's actually change it to that. Um, this is usually something that you think of right in the beginning, or you should be thinking of right in the beginning when you start your game. You and your three other friends, you're sitting together in um, a garage, in a coffee shop, wherever, and you're saying, hey, let's build this game. And you're saying this is great. Um, at some point, very, very early in the process, and you think about what belongs to whom, how you're going to sell it, because later on you don't want to run into issues with people saying, well, I did all the art and that was so much work, um, I should be getting more money than that guy who just wrote code and he's, the code that he had to write was really, really easy, or whatever it might be. So we are going to talk about that a little bit, even though I'm building this game on my own, there are some interesting um, issues that will probably need to be kept in mind because of the process of live streaming. But that's all for um, tonight. I hope you guys um, found that interesting. Um, and please let me know um, in the comments if there's anything that is unclear or if you have any suggestions or um, just want to chat. Thanks so much for watching and um, I'll hopefully have, a, uh, have episode two up shortly where we'll actually start digging into this whole idea of um, intellectual property very briefly because it's not the most fun thing to do and then get into our procedural generation algorithm which I think is going to be really cool. Thank you and uh, good night.